Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. So I like to finish my session on convexity adjustments and yeah, to some extent also this part of the lecture where we had a deeper look into analytic valuations. So we did before the Black Scholes model, Bachelier model, yeah, assuming special modeling assumptions that allowed to derive an analytic formula. And convexity adjustment are, are still in the spirit, but okay, it is a bit harder to derive an analytic formula because um, the payment is in some unnatural unit. Yeah. So there are some correlation covariance effects. And um, I like to finish with the very nice example of the CMS adjustment, the adjustment you get if you like to value a constant maturity swap. So uh, I will recapitulate the definition of a swap and then define the constant maturity swap. What I would like to do is I would like to apply our very nice theorem that told us if I have an index X, uh, that is, for example, a martingale under Qn. So there is a natural payment unit N here. Uh, but I would like to consider paying in units of M. So maybe in some other unit. So here's the M. So I pay a function F of this index in units of M. If I like to value this, then there is a nice little relation. If I know uh, an analytic valuation formula, if I value it in the natural unit, say so here the natural unit n, then I can oops, then I can reuse this valuation formula if I just modify the initial value. Yeah, so all the other objects, so my model for x and my payoff function, they remain the same in the valuation formula, but um, I just modify now the initial value of the index in a certain way yeah, to get an adjusted formula. And this adjustment is here below. So that's now the convexity adjusted rate, the convexity adjusted initial value of my valuation formula. And it related to the drift that I get if I move to the martingale measure that corresponds to the other unit. Of course, yeah, if you have a deterministic drift adjustment, you can pack this into the initial value. We had an alternative version of this uh, little theorem if I have a log normal process. Okay, if I have a log normal process, then the condition on the drift can be written here that the instantaneous covariance of my index X and the change of payment unit um, exhibits this log normal drift. Yeah, so X times M divided by N times gamma. Now let's turn to the nice example of a CMS adjustment constant maturity swap. And the constant maturity swap is quite popular. It's quite strange, but it's uh, uh, it's a strange product, but it's quite uh, popular. Uh, so maybe for an insurance company, yeah, maybe I can comment a little bit on the application. So, but let me first review the textbook swap. So I consider now a very large tenor discretization. Yeah, so we have a time discretization here, our tenor structure, T1 to Tn. And on this, I consider a swap on, say, a subset. Yeah, so say a subtenor. So it starts in Tk and it ends in Tk plus M. And I will vary the starting point later. So the swap always has a constant length. Yeah? So it's going from here to there, always with a constant length. So if the starting point is shifted by six months, the end point is also shifted by six months. So we have a family of swaps and they all have the same length. So they have a constant maturity. If you view them 
from the starting point. Yeah. So for example, uh, the difference between TK plus M and TK is always 10 years. Uh, I always consider a 10 year swap, but now I consider different 10 year swaps with different starting points. So that's the setup yeah, just from the notation. Uh, so what is a swap? So a swap exchanges uh, the forward rate fixed at the beginning of the period. So see here, there is the TI yeah, for the period from TI to TI plus one fixed at the beginning of the period minus a fixed rate. So we don't consider the fixed rate. Yeah, so that's here my SI times the period length, and that is paid at the end of the period. So that is paid here in TI plus one. So that's a swap and it pays this for all periods. Maybe let's draw a picture. Let's draw the picture here. So I have here a tenor discretization. So now I have a huge one, say this is T1, this is T2 and so on. And there is on this discretization, there is the fixed lag. So the fixed lag is not of much interest to me now. Okay. So there's the fixed lag. So I say pay something. So assume my st swap starts here, pay at the end of the first period. So I pay here. So I pay some constant. So that's the fixed lag. And I receive some variable forward rate. Okay, so I receive some variable forward rate. Now let's assume my swap has these four periods here. Okay, so the swap runs from here to there. Okay, so that's the swap. Receive, fix, pay, floating for, sorry, pay, fix, receive floating for four periods. Yeah? So that's the swap, the swap starting here, ending here. So this is my classical swap. Then we saw that we can replace the variable floating rates. So since the floating rate is fixed at each beginning of the period, well, they differ maybe a lot, yeah? So we can have a smaller one here and a larger one here, yeah? Maybe this guy is like that, and this guy is like that. So they are all fixed at the beginning of the period, yeah? So I'm fixing here this floating rate. I'm fixing here this floating rate. I'm fixing here this floating rate, and so on. So I can replace this by a constant swap rate, well, but it's a stochastic process. And in which sense do I replace it? Paying this floating stream has the same value as paying a swap rate. So this depends, however, on when you observe this. Okay, so when you observe it here, yeah, you can look, okay, what is the expectation of these payments? And you can now replace these expected values with a constant. But that depends on when you observe it. If you observe it here, yeah, you have maybe different expectations on the future. So but we what we did is we could also say, okay, at the beginning of the swap, what is the expectation of, of these values? And what would be an equivalent constant payment? So I could replace this with an equivalent constant payment, which is the swap rate. Okay, so where is that? That's somehow an average, yeah. So that average here is exactly always the same. Okay, so some of these green guys are larger, some are smaller. So maybe I should draw that guy a bit larger. Okay, so now my blue line is somehow like the weighted average. Okay, so this is my swap rate. So the green ones are the forward rates that are pay. Yeah? So this here is Li fixed in Ti. Yeah, so if this time here is Ti, 
Okay. And this guy is my S of TK. If I observe it, the TK at the beginning, so say this here is now my TK. Yeah. So if I observe that, yeah, I pay always the S of TK. So all these guys are the same. Okay, so introducing the swap rate, that was in my picture blue, I could replace the queen floating rate payments with a fixed rate payment that has viewed in TK the same value. So this means if I consider it in TK, so we fix here everything in TK, then this corresponds to paying the constant S of TK at the future points in times. So this is just a portfolio of zero copper bonds. That portfolio of zero copper bonds was called the swap annuity. Yeah? So we introduced the swap annuity. So you remember the swap annuity a, so if we start in K and if we end in K plus M, okay, this was delta Ti P Ti plus one. So pay in at the end of each period. And now I runs, okay, from K to K plus M minus one, okay? So the last payment is in K plus M. So, just this means here that we pay this constant at these variable points. But you see the constant is fixed at the beginning now of the swap. So I'm, I'm sitting here yeah, and I see that I value all the queen payments. I value all the queen payments and I say, Okay, sitting at the beginning of the swap, paying these variable amounts is the same as paying this constant, the constant seen in this point. So that was a helpful rewriting of the swap, yeah, because we could replace the stream of forward rates by paying a single stochastic process. Yeah? And that later allowed us here, this single stochastic process is now my underlying. I pay you this underlying at many different points that allowed us to derive a black scholes formula, for example, for uh, a swap chain yeah, by considering a log normal model for this single stochastic process. So instead of having multiple objects that are paid, yeah, I now have a single object that is paid at different times. That was the trick that allowed us to derive the swap chain valuation. Now, a constant maturity swap does a strange modification. So instead of paying the forward rates, we now pay the swap rates, but in each period, I recalculate the swap rate for a corresponding swap. So you see what has changed here are two things. First, I'm refixing the swap rate at each beginning of the period. That's not the case for a swap. The swap fixes the swap rate at the beginning and he has an equivalent constant paid all the time, right? So that's the difference. And then fixing a new swap rate means that actually I look at a different swap this is the swap that starts in I and ends in I plus M, right? Here it is the swap rate for that swap. If I turn to my picture, what the constant maturity swap does now is the following. So if we move to the first period, we pay this amount, yeah? As we should for all the coming periods. But then if we have arrived at the first period, we will consider another swap 
that starts at this period has the same length, yeah? so ends at one period in addition. And we look at a new swap rate. So maybe that swap rate is now this one. What is this object? So if this here is S of TK, no? so S is always the swap rate for a 10-year swap, then this object is S of TK plus one. Okay, and now he continues, yeah? So he considers just another swap that starts here and ends there calculates all the swap rates for this swap. So these are now here, these guys, all the swap rates, one, two, three, four, and just paste this single swap rate in this period. This guy is paid in this period. So from the second swap, yeah, it's for the second period, it is paid at the end yeah, of the second period, so at the third time point. And now this guy is paid at this period. So let me make these lines here a little bit clearer. So this would be the swap rate that we pay in a classical swap, so this is the S of T K, but now the constant maturity swap pays the S of T I. Okay, so that's a strange thing, yeah? So, because if you pay something variable, you would pay the forward rate fixed at the beginning of the period T I, the i's forward rate, but instead you pay the swap rate for a 10-year swap just at that period, and at the next period you can calculate, recalculate a new swap rate. So this is not the natural way to do it, yeah? So we have a swap, and instead of paying forward rates for each period, we pay recalculated swap rates. So for example, we have a 10 year swap and in each period we pay the 10 year swap rate. So at the end of the swap, actually in the last period, we calculate again the 10 year swap rate. So the whole length covers a little bit like 20 years of interest rates. Yeah? So it runs for 10 years, but it always looks 10 years into the future. Yeah, what could that be? A company could have some um, exposure to long-term interest rates, yeah? for example, an insurance company, uh, but it would like to regularly exchange payments on this long-term interest rate. So maybe the company is not so much interested in the short-term rate. It would like to have some long-term rate and then exchange this long-term rate on a regular basis. This is an unnatural product because we are now paying the swap rate at ti plus one and not at many different times. Yeah? So not in terms of the swap annuity. I pay it just at a single time. I pay it in terms of the bond. Yeah? So this here corresponds to p ti plus one. Yeah? I pay in units of this zero copper bond, the swap rate. So the PTI plus one is the natural unit for the forward rate, but now I pay the swap rate in this unit. So here's the definition, the constant maturity swap. The constant maturity swap pays the swap rate for some constant maturity. So it's always here the swap rate with a fixed length tenor on a regular basis yeah, where the swap rate is fixed always 
be fixed always again at the beginning of the period paid at the end of the period. So you see it's unnatural because the natural thing would be pay forward rate at the end of the period and now I pay swap rate at the end of the period. My little theorem was paying in an unnatural unit. Here I have the situation I pay an unnatural index. But of course we could just flip the interpretation. The natural unit for a swap is pay the swap rate at the coming times. So pay the swap rate in terms of the swap annuity. So we could just reinterpret this as instead of paying here the swap annuity, I pay here in units of a zero copper bond. I just pay once instead of many times. So I can reinterpret it. Paying the right index, the index SI, so this is now my natural index, but I pay it in the wrong unit instead of paying it in units of the swap annuity, which is the natural one. I now pay in units of the zero copper bond, which is unnatural. So my index X in the theorem is the swap rate, and I pay the swap rate in units of the zero copper bond. So it's um, the constant maturity swap does this then repeatedly, but this is just the portfolio of such payments. Yeah? So it is enough to consider, it is sufficient to consider just a single payment, namely that one of a swap rate at the end of a period yeah? and uh, derive the valuation yeah, for this unnatural payment. So you see, I'm a little bit in the situation of my theorem. So this here is my X. This here is my N, the natural unit. And this here is my M. Since I just consider a single payment, all these indices, yeah, they don't matter. And I can simplify the situation a little bit. So just consider the case where I pay a swap rate S instead of in units of the swap annuity A in units of a zero copper bond P capital T. Yeah, So I just write here the capital T. So we have this situation, yeah, which now fits to our little theorem. I pay a function, yeah. So I just consider a general case could be a CMS option, an option on such a thing. Uh, so I pay uh, a function of the swap. Wow. So I pay a function of the swap rate in units of the zero copper bond. But my natural unit, which I would choose as numerea, is the swap annuity. So this looks a little bit like the Quanto, yeah? pay in a different unit. And what we had for the Quanto caplet was we needed a model for S. And now I also needed a stochastic process, a model for P divided by A. So it looks a little bit as if we now need a model for P divided by A, like we did for the Quanto, where we modeled the M divided by N, yeah, or there it was actually the N divided by M uh, for the quanto. The thing why I like this example here is that it shows you that you can even value this just with a single stochastic model for S. Yeah? And this gives us then the Hunt-Kennedy CMS adjustment. So it's a special, it's a special model assumption here behind. So I consider a log normal process for S, so I will consider a log normal process for S later. And what is the process that I assume for P divided by A? Well, P is a zero cover bond, it's related to interest rates. A is a portfolio of zero cover bonds, it's related to interest rates. S is an interest rate. So if I just would like to have a single stochastic model, can I model P divided by A in terms of S. 
And yes, I can do this because first observation, S is a martingale under the measure corresponding to the annuity QA. But P divided by A is also a QA martingale. And linear functions of martingales are martingales. So let's make the ansatz and assume that P divided by A is a linear function of S. So both are stochastic processes. So there is, of course, here an of T. Yeah? But assume that I have deterministic yeah, constant coefficients. Of course, it could depend on the model assumption, on the capital T, for example, on the maturity. But I have coefficients A and B such that the P divided by A is a linear function of S. That's just a model assumption. And this model assumption leads to the fact that I need a single stochastic model for S because then I also have the stochastic model for P divided by A. Uh, what are now the choices for A and B? Well, first look for A. If interest rates are zero, then S is zero. S is a convex combination of the forward rates. If all forward rates are zero, then S will be zero. The zero Cooper bond will be equal to one. And the swap annuity is a sum of zero Cooper bonds multiplied with the period discretization is just the length of the swap. Okay, so then for this special case, I have a certain kind of boundary conditions in the well, values of the interest rates. Yeah, So if zero is, for example, considered a boundary and you see, if you solve this, yeah, so this here is zero, yeah, this is a one, this is a length of the swap. You see that A is just the one divided by the length of the swap. That makes sense because instead of paying um, just at every period, I just consider here a payment P divided by A that pays at the first period, yeah? So it's just a fraction of what I pay, yeah? It's one divided by the length of the swap because I multiply with the period length. Um, how do we choose the parameter B? Well, on the left-hand side, I have a martingale. On the right-hand side, I have a martingale. So if I take expectation of both sides, I get the same equation also in zero. So just to match the initial condition in zero, so plug in little t equal to zero, and you can solve for b. So this is just that your model should fulfill this relation, this linear combination today yeah, in the observation mode. That's it. That's a nice little trick. And now, I can write my unnatural payoff. So pay F of S in units of P evaluated under the measure QA, yeah, the natural measure under which S is a martingale. So I can now write down the value. Yeah, this guy here is a linear function. So expectation of linear function you know, is the linear function of the expectations. So I just get um, a natural expression, A times F of ST. So my valuation formula when I'm just here in the natural units. Okay, everything is fine. And I get something that has an S squared, yeah? So B times expectation F of S multiplied with S. Okay, so you can rewrite the S uh, by its definition, yeah, but essentially this here is now the thing we have to value. So this here is now my M divided by N. So, and what I have to look at is DS, D, M divided by N. Okay, so this is now ds, ds, 
And if I now assume a log normal model, then this is S squared sigma squared dt. So I have that my gamma is the sigma squared. So I can now apply my theorem, yeah, the version here. Yeah, so this is my ds, ds is my s squared gamma dt. Yeah, so I can now apply my little theorem and get the corresponding convexity adjustment for the CMS. Yeah? And it looks like the one we had for the LIBOR in arrears, for the forward rate in arrears. So pay the forward rate at an unnatural time. Here, pay the swap rate at an unnatural time in the sense that it's an unnatural unit. So that is, we can now apply here our theorem and we get gamma is sigma squared. So putting parts together, you can value here a derivative pig in the unnatural unit by using your valuation formula that uses the natural unit where the second part, the one with the S squared here has a, an adjusted swap rate, the CMS adjusted swap rate inside. Yeah? And you see our model assumption, of course, is also here. Uh, we have the coefficients A and B there. That was it for the convexity adjustments. Um, yeah, this is the convexity adjusted swap rate. Uh, I have some literature, yeah. Original one, Hunt and Kennedy, they have a nice, nice book, if you like, to have a look into this. And that was it for the analytic valuations. Thanks.